This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. I will now take a roll call, board members, as you hear your name called, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then please place yourself back on mute. Michael Burtwistle. I'm here. Maria Chow. Here. Jack Jemsek. Here. David Levenstein. Here. Doug Marshall. Present. And Janet McGowan. Did I, can I hear you, Janet? No, it looks like she doesn't have the sound connected on her computer. Okay. Um, can you sort that out? Yeah, do we, um, is there a chat function? Oops. No. Did she provide a cell phone number? Can you text her or call her? Or? Yeah, let me, um, do you, uh, hey, Janet, how about a thumbs up? <laughs> no, I'm not even sure she's hearing us. Yeah, I, I like it. All right, so while you sort that out, Sean, I'm going to continue to read through my opening comments. Sounds good. Because that's just general stuff. Okay. Board members, if technical difficulties arise, such as this, uh, we may need to pause temporarily to rectify the problem and then continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, please let the IT support representative or PAM know. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will know if a disconnection has occurred. Please use the raise hand button or function to ask a question or make a comment. You will see the raised hand, sorry, I will see the raised hand and call upon you to speak. After speaking, please remember to re-mute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and at other appropriate times throughout the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment during the public comment period, any of them, you must join the meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link. This link is shown on the slide, which I think Pam is gonna put up a slide. Oops, I'm sorry, I was texting Sean. No worries. So what, what I do you want to see? The, your general information, how you can connect with this meeting um, that shows the Zoom link. Great. So there you can see, you can type that in. So you can enter that into a search, uh, search engine, that web address. The link can also be found on the meeting agenda, which can be located um, at least in two ways on the town website. One is through the calendar um, on the home page listing this meeting, and you can find the link within the event details, which you can click on. A second way is to go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda link. On the agenda document, there is a link towards the top of the page where it states virtual meeting. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raised hand button when the public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called upon, Please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when you're finished speaking. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If these guidelines are not complied with or the speaker exceeds his allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. Moving onward now, uh, the slide will show the uh, meeting agenda, which I think we have that next. There we go. Thanks. Uh, again, note the virtual meeting Zoom link at the top of the page. As chair, I am taking the liberty to move public comment, which is shown on item two, to the end of the meeting after item five. 
This will give the public additional time to be able to log into Zoom and familiarize themselves with this technology. So now moving to item one, uh, we have minutes and it is my understanding that we do not have any minutes. That's correct, Chris? That is correct. Just Chris. unmuted, yes, okay. that's correct, no minutes. Great. Wonderful, okay, so now we will move to item three. which is a uh, preliminary presentation. Okay. Uh, Kendrick Park Playground Design, preliminary presentation by Nate Malloy, Senior Planner, and Christine Bestrup, Planning Director, uh, Park Grant and CPA, uh, CPAC Funded Playground. Here is, uh, and then they provide a link um, on our agenda or on the agenda to the information on the town website. So I believe we have Nate Malloy with us. Yes, I'm here. Can everyone hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Yes. <clears throat> All right. Thanks. Yeah, Nate Malloy here, planner with the town. Uh, Christina, as you stated, I'll just reaffirm the town applied for a park grant, it's a state grant. Uh, for $400,000 for Kendrick Park. We were awarded it. It's a two-year grant. And so um, the idea is that this is a, a preliminary presentation and, um, you know, the town will follow up with a site plan review application to the planning board, uh, you know, for review early next month. Um, this is also in lieu of uh, a public forum. You know, this can serve as that, uh, you know, we have a web page so this this presentation can go online and then we have an online comment form and uh, possibly tonight there may be comments. So this is also a way to, for the planning board and for the public to view the preliminary plan. Uh, next slide, Pam, or yep. I don't think I can control it. This one? Yep, there's a product overview. Great, yeah, so the town, uh, we received the grant in fall 2009. It's a two year design build grant. Um, uh, you know, we received four hundred thousand dollars. So the um, you know we had to receive uh, some matching funds or local funds. Um, town council approved two hundred sixty thousand dollars of CPA funds um, this past winter. The so the total amount uh, for the project is about uh, six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The um, the state has a pretty rigorous schedule and it hasn't been extended yet. So. By June 1st, they'd like to have the plans uh, be finalized to almost be bid ready. They'd like the town to um, bid the project this summer and have construction start in the fall. And it needed to be, it needs to be concluded by June 1st uh, next year of 2021. Um, maybe with the health crisis, it may be extended, but just uh, yesterday we were, um, they hadn't yet. So uh, we're moving forward with the design plans now and we're talking with vendors and you know, trying to figure out um, how to complete it within within this within the schedule. Uh, next slide, Pam. Great. So the you know the town applied, um, uh, you know, last year we did. We've held um, a few public meetings. We also used the 2011 process um, as guidance as well uh, to inform. Uh, some design decisions. So through the public comments um, last summer in this January's meeting, you know, a lot of the public really would like uh, naturalized elements. So um, minimize the amount of manufactured equipment and offer, um, you know, the ability for people to play on stone surfaces or natural surfaces and with natural materials. Um, you know, keep the hardscape to a minimum, preserve the existing trees and vegetation, and then have an inclusive play area. Uh, that's been, you know, a, a theme that's been um, recommended. Uh, so the design you'll see, you know, there's a, a team of staff from Public Works, Leisure Services, and Planning that have been working on this preliminary design. And in addition to uh, the comments from the public meetings, and those summary uh, notes from the meetings are on the Kendrick Park webpage, you know, staff also looked at making sure everything's accessible uh, the equipment is accessible. So not only is it, um, you know, meets accessibility, we're also trying to include some 
some play equipment that uh, can be used by uh, different different um, different users. Uh, you know, we have utilities and stormwater to manage. There's safety and maintenance, uh, which are important uh, factors. And then also trying to maintain as much of the existing park as possible. So, you know, the earlier plan by the Cecil Group and, you know, some other plans that may have, um, you know, may be available online, they didn't necessarily preserve all the existing trees or topography. So the current design scheme really tries to, again, minimize the impact on the landscape of Kendrick Park. Uh, next slide, Pam. Thanks. Uh, on January 9th, there was a meeting at the Bank Center and we showed a few different boards with um, images of, you know, various types of play equipment and playground design. And so we had asked members um, of the public that were attending to, you know, use green dots to indicate things that were preferred and red dots for items that were uh, least preferable. And so, you know, there's this slide and the following slide shows what what people liked. And so, you know, just summarizing what, what's shown here visually, again, it's the natural features. It's, um, you know, not the hardscape or thematic play equipment. So, you know, sometimes at some parks you might see whether it's bold colors or certain themes, that was something that was not seen as favorable in Kendrick Park. Um, next slide, Pam. Yeah. Great. It just takes a second. Okay. There yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so again, here you can see that, you know, in the upper left corner, you know, uh, members also liked um, things that could be manufactured but had a more natural looking appearance, um, you know, not necessarily things that were bright in color. And so this is something that staff, you know, there was a number of staff at this meeting and this was all part of the consideration when developing the preliminary design. Next slide. Great. And so this, this is the 2011 schematic design that was prepared by the Cecil group. And, you know, they, they, there was a, um, you know, a Kendrick Park design advisory committee and a, you know, a long public process to determine how to program Kendrick Park. And so within the park, you know, in the Southern area of the park, you know, they had a more urban uh, landscape and then there was green space. And then in the red circle, they had already identified an area for a playground or a play area and then a larger green space to the north. And so uh, staff still located the playground in the general area of the 2011 plan, you know, with the idea that this plan could be impl implemented in phases. And so um, there was a reason that the playground was located there. There's uh, some slope right to the south of it um, on, the lower, on the lower portion. And so, you know, the, the location of the playground remained generally the same and it doesn't have the same shape necessarily because the Cecil group didn't take into account existing trees or topography. So this was almost as if they considered Kendrick Park a clean slate. And so they didn't try to preserve anything existing on the park. And we determined we really wanted to. Uh, next slide, Pam. So this slide actually shows the, the, the design in its current form. When the town applied for the park grant, it may have looked a little different. And that was again because we we needed a concept design to apply for funding, and it wasn't ground truth in terms of trees or topography. Um, if you go to the next slide, Pam, I have a few call outs that might be easier to read. Mm -hmm. You know uh, what's important is on the lower portion of the design, there's a paved walkway that goes relatively east to west across the park, and so there's a wider walkway that you know would be maintained uh, in the winter months too. It'd become um, essentially a, a you know a uh, sidewalk that could be used throughout the year. Um, just north of that, you know, is the main formal playing area. The, uh, you know, staff is still considering using a rubberized surface with some equip manufactured equipment here. Uh, this helps with making it inclusive and universally accessible. And, you know, we've looked at different options for surfacing, um, having it be permeable rubber, um, but there would still be, there need to be some safe surface there for uh, fall safe zones from equipment. So if any, you know, if users are up on uh, an elevated platform or even on play equipment, it's now required to have some type of uh, accessible safe surface underneath. Um, you know, there's also a sitting area further. If, I'm not sure how you'd see it on your screen closer to North Pleasant Street, but, you know, there's a separate sitting area 
we're envisioning that now with a low sitting wall around it and um, tables and chairs and possibly some space for, um, it could be for, you know, art installations or for just, you know, uh, things to be displayed there. The walkways are shown in yellow on this plan. Those are all accessible walkways and they're all, um, you know, they're considered walkways, they're not ramps. So they're all, you know, five to six feet wide and, uh, you know, they, someone could walk through this doing a loop. Along North Pleasant Street, you can see on the outside of the design, there's a lot of plantings and there's some, if you looked in the details, there are some rocks and certain things. So instead of a formal fence, we're using um, vegetation and other elements as a barrier uh, because we're close to that side of the street. Uh, moving north um, up in the design, there's, um, oh, I didn't have a drop area to it. There, there's a naturalized play area. So it's something that's shown in brown outside of the yellow walkway. We're, we're looking at that as an area where there would be, um, you know, actually rocks, um, you know, logs, tree stumps, and other things that would be um, on the ground with possibly wood chips underneath, but that would be a natural play area. So there'd be no manufactured equipment in there. And it would be, you know, outside the other um, formal play area, still within visibility uh, and walking distance, but, you know, somewhat separated. Um, and I guess I'll continue going up. There's a stage area just inside the walkway. And so if you see the stage area and then there's a sand pit with the digger further up, the walkway uh, close to North Pleasant Street is actually a sloped walkway and it goes up to a five and a half foot hill, hilltop um, there's a round little um, platform up there with, you know, there's gonna be stones like a turret, but that, that walkway on the left is all sloping up. And so the stage is built into the hillside and then the sand pit is built into the hillside. And then there's a, a hillside slide that goes down to, um, you know, to a flat area and there's stairs shown in uh, like red and gray. And, you know, the sand pit has a digger, it has, you know, natural logs that are vertical as a border and on the other side of the walkway, there's granite blocks and other stones for kids to play on. And so it's a, you know, it's a more of a linear play area um, and there's different elements throughout. The, um, you know, this would be a daytime use park. Uh, like every other park in Amherst, there's no, we're not envisioning any lighting within the park. There may, there will be some lights along the, the, the walkway, the east-west walkway. Um, you know, there, there'll be a sign with rules and regulations. Uh, there's a pollinator garden uh, just below the stage. Um, you know, most of it will just be um, grass, at, you know, outside the areas and different plantings. We're trying to preserve as many trees as possible and also plant a few. Um, I think that's good for now. Um, Pam, if you go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So these are some images, uh, one, one vendor, Emmy um, O'Brien is a larger company. They represent a number of different vendors for um, playgrounds, for outdoor equipment, for uh, various things. And so they're, um, you know, they represent probably about a dozen different companies. And these are some images that they provided. You know, we've given them our, our, our schematic design. And so these images are actually to scale and trying to show what some some equipment would look like. And so these are manufactured equipment um, in the formal play area. Uh, and this is just to give you a sense for what the spacing would be like, what works with our budget, and then you know what would actually fit in that play area. So uh, you know, anywhere from three to five pieces of equipment um, because of the safety zones that need to be around them. You know, the, the play equipment is really targeted at two age groups, the way it's manufactured, uh, two to five-year-olds and five to 12-year-olds. Although, you know, they say, you know, anyone can use it, adults, it's supposed to be sturdy enough, but um, they really do have, you know, those two age groups are what the, the vendors use as specific targets for sizes and levels of, of equipment. Uh, the next slide, Pam. Thanks. Uh, here's the upper right is showing the hillside slide with the steps and then the uh, sand pit and the digger. Uh, you know, that, you know, the slope will be pretty steep on the hill, not, not, um, you know, not, you know, maybe three to one enough so, so that grass can still grow, but it'll be something that you know, can be used. Again, another um, 
concept of the play area showing just different equipment with natural colors and um, a few different types of, of equipment for different age groups. Next slide. Great, for the resources, you know, we do have a web page. The link is here. It's under the planning department, uh, planning projects, and then Kendrick Park. It's also on the LSSC webpage and, um, and the public works department. And so we're trying to encourage people to use that as a, as a resource. Um, there's also an online comment form that's linked from the webpage, but people can submit comments and upload files, uh, uh, for instance, images or anything if they have um, things they would like to show. Um, there's also from the Kendrick Park webpage, the 2010 process, the Kendrick Park Design Advisory Committee. There's a link to the, you know, this, uh, that committee's webpage. Um, there's a lot of information there. Um, and I think that's it for now. If there's any comments or questions, um, we can, I can write those down. Okay, so I'll open it up to the board uh, for questions. I just first want to check in with Chris Bestrop. Do you have anything to add? The only thing I'd like to add is that um, the public and everyone will have at least two more chances to look at this um, in a formal setting. Um, the Design Review Board will be reviewing this next Wednesday, um, and I think their meeting is at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and they'll be using the same format that we're using but they'll be reviewing it again um, hopefully we'll have some more details by that time and then the planning board will be reviewing this on may 6th so both of those meetings will be online and open to the public and um, i believe that they would both accept public comment um, verbal and written comment okay. thank you um, so at this time I'll open it up to questions um, to the board. So if you can hit your raise hand and I will call on you as I see you pop up. And then just please remember after you speak um, to remute yourself. I don't see, oh, I see a hand. Oh, no, it disappeared. I see dogs. Oh, there's a, all right. So, uh, Doug, you have a question. Yeah, I had a question about the uh, hard surfaced walkway that's shown maybe on uh, the close up plan of the, of the area. Back two or three uh, slides. It looks like it doesn't go straight across the park. And I'm wondering whether it might be more usable to people who are crossing the park if it's followed uh, the desire line or whether it's just supposed to be a sort of meandering path that doesn't, it's just for somebody taking a walk rather than trying to get somewhere. Sure, yeah, the, um, right, the park uh, or the walkway near North Pleasant Street goes south and that's because uh, there's a cross walk just down there near McClellan Street. So otherwise it would, the path, if you just went straight across, would not bring you to anything on the other side. It would be a mid, mid block crossing. And so uh, it's, it, it, I think it's two purposes. One, right, it's a, a bit of a meander. It works with the topography well that way and, the, and drainage. And then it brings you to a, um, to a crosswalk so that, you know, people aren't trying to um, cross somewhere where they're not, you know, where we may not have a corresponding curb cut on the other side. Um, if I could just add to that while you're talking about that, um, just along East Pleasant, there appear to be, if we, Pam, if you could switch to the other schematic design picture showing the whole park, there's just a lot of crossings. I was wondering, you know, I know this is a balance between trying to balance, as Doug was saying, you know, the paths that they, they choose to take and providing, but there's four just along the park. And then there's a lot. Um, Pam, can you switch the slide to the, the previous one? 
Yeah, one slide up, Pam. Yeah, there you go. So you can see on the east hand side, there's four crosswalks, but then there's a bunch of crosswalks around. Um, actually, this doesn't show the roundabout. There's a lot of crosswalks now. Um, so just from a driver's perspective, that's a lot to watch. I mean, these are pretty close together. Yeah. We haven't contemplated any crosswalks on East Pleasant yet um, as part of this, but it is a consideration. Yeah, just if they could, you know, I know the DPW is working on this design, so they're aware of that kind of thing, but I just noticed there's a lot of crosswalks. Mm -hmm. So it's that balance, putting enough, but yet keeping it to the minimal that you can. Mm -hmm. And funneling pedestrians, you know, it, there is certain controls you can use to push them in desirable ways. Okay, um, I see two other hands. I'm gonna recognize, up oh, now I see three. So I'm gonna go with Maria first. Um, thanks for that, Nate. I really like the presentation. I really like the variety of um, activities and age groups and being very inclusive. I think that makes a lot of sense um, to promote sort of the diversity of the community you're hoping to bring to this. Um, I would like to just add, as you move forward with the design to consider the future implications for the rest of the park and to um, think about what we were just talking about, like the connections to not only the other urban spaces and crosswalks, but also, I don't know if um, utilities were considered as far as if there's public restrooms in the future and um, other lighting. But um, I think, yeah, we kind of touched on it already where right now as it's drawn on the plan you're showing, you know, I think it hits the side of nothing on the uh, east, uh, sorry, no, that's correct, on the east side of um, East Pleasant Street. So hopefully there'll be a better connection to like a point so that it's not just hitting the side of that existing building. That, um, the new building that's there now. Um, so just, yeah, and then as you move forward to sort of think about future implications of what it's connecting to, as well as like, I think you're showing some angled parking and one way for that street on the west. Um, mm -hmm. So think about, yeah, like how other future steps will impact the park. So you're not kind of bottled into a corner or have to undo anything that you plan right now. But otherwise, um, I, yeah, I like the variety and how you've sort of you maximize as much as you could um, with the existing trees and topography. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. Yep. That's it. Okay. Um, I'll recognize Michael next. Am I on? You are. Okay. Yeah. Um, Nate, I, I agree uh, with Maria that, that it's an excellent uh, collection of, of uh, spaces for which uh, kids can enjoy themselves. Um, I, and I, I, I'm concerned in this kind of the same way that uh, while it makes sense to connect to McClellan Street on the, uh, on the North Pleasant uh, Street side, uh, I'm unclear uh, looking at the uh, schematic, the original uh, Cecil schematic design, where it would come out on the uh, East Pleasant side, um, it's it's. Can you give me a, a a building location that where it would terminate? Yeah. So the um, it comes out right now um, across from the uh, the entryway to what was you know the Bertucci's restaurant. Oh. So there's there's an existing area where there's a uh, had been a curb cut where DPW often um, will pull their trucks up from East Pleasant. I know and this. So, yes. Okay. So, so uh, that's the area, and the hope is that from East Pleasant Street, this entry into the park would become, you know, you can see it on on this plan now. It becomes what could be a main entry to other interior walkways. So that would become, a, you know, as Christine mentioned, a funnel point. Hopefully, that this could serve as a, you know, another main entry point. Uh, we have bike racks near East Pleasant. We are anticipating putting some benches there, so it becomes a, you know, a. A major entry there. Um, that's where it connects to you. Yeah. When the um, when you come back with to the planning board for a 
for permitting. Um, mm -hmm. It would be really useful, I think, if we could see a, some kind of overlay where uh, the current proposal is overlaid on the schematic design so we can see exactly how the original relates. Clearly, the new proposal for the play area is larger than the one in the schematic design. Uh, but exactly how much larger and what that means for the rest of the park would be useful information. Okay. Can you do that? Uh, yeah, we can do that. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, that's it for me. Mm -hmm. This time I'll recognize Janet. Okay, am I here? You are. Great. Um, I didn't, I didn't really like the playground and I, I had trouble. I went out and looked at the site today and I had a little trouble locating where it would be partly because it's not, this is an overlay on a much older map of the area. So it's hard to sort of figure that out. Um, I thought the seating areas were really great. I just liked the idea of it overall. I had a couple of very specific concerns. Like some of them are very overarching ones um, about, you know, safety of kids playing in the park and running into the street. And I wonder if a little hill or some shrubs would really be enough. And if you need to put some kind of fencing around the playground to make sure kid, little kids are in the park, stay in the park, or don't go out and chase the ball or something like that into traffic. Um, you know, cause it's, and I understand like not wanting a fence, but I also think it'd be good to contain um, kids in and then questions that have been raised um, by members of the public is about students. This is kind of a walkway for college students from UMass on a Thursday or Friday or Saturday night walking into town and then possibly walking back to UMass in a different condition and using that park um, in, in ways that weren't expected. So I wondered if, the, um, if you had looked at just having a fence and access point and a gate where you could lock it kind of like a true urban park would do especially one for younger kids to keep kids in and to keep other, you know, older adults out. And I wondered if you had thought about that. Oh uh, yeah. Thanks. That was a consideration. I mean, we had said that, you know, unless it's a extremely high fence, uh, it's something that college kids would could, you know, get over or it necessarily wouldn't keep them out. Um, you know, it, it is something that has been mentioned. We still consider about right. How, you know, how the long-term maintenance of this, um, of this public space, um, you know, how it can be maintained if there's, if it does become attractive uh, after dark, um, you know, there may need to be, as it is a, a park, you know, we can, there can be a greater, you know, there can be a sign saying that it's closed after dark and that allows the police to tell people to leave. We hope it doesn't become, you know, a patrol issue, but um, you, you know, that's something that still, you know, ha has to be seen. In terms of a fence, you know, that was discussed too, in terms of even different types of fencing. Um, you know, I, we were weighing the, the aesthetic of a fence against the maintenance of it. And then also the, um, you know, how effective is it? Um, you know, right now there's no barriers at Kendrick Park and oftentimes there's families and kids playing there. And it's actually more open to the streets, both East Pleasant and North Pleasant. So, you know, on the North Pleasant side where the play area is closer to the street, we do have, you know, there's a sloped area off the walkway. There's a curb, there's curbing six foot high curbing in places there's a sitting wall uh there's rocks and boulders and what will be a pretty dense um you know plantings of, of shrubs and bushes and ground cover um so you know we were trying to use that as a as the as the fence as opposed to you know a um something that is you know a, like a chain link fence or a, a metal fence um it's still something that we were discussing but we we're learning we're leaning towards more of this other you know this alternative type of barrier um, yeah, I've seen some very attractive fences in urban parks. I think students or college students will be in that park at, on weekend nights and nights. And I think that I'm not sure I would even bother waiting to see and just assume that's going to happen. And is that going to add to, you know, like in a way would a fence work? And I think the answer is probably yes. Um, and I just think, I think, you know, you have hundreds of students walking back and forth um, at least three nights a week. Um, the other thing, I have a lot of really specific things, um, and I don't know if you want to hear this all now or if it would be better to get it by email later. Um, I, I had a quick question about, I was looking at the budget, like it's kind of preliminary budget figures you had presented in the fall, and the most, the biggest ticket item was the rubber, um, you know, surface, and I was wondering, 
um, that just, it was like over $200,000 and that seemed really mm -hmm. high to me. And then when I've gone to other parks, there's like six or seven other parks and playgrounds in Amherst and they almost all use wood chips. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wondered, you know, that seems like a huge ticket item. Yeah, I think, you know, most places wood chips are, you know, have to be maintained and the state is actually considering not allowing them because it's typically not accessible. Usually you have to, you know, you have to use it. It's considered like a wood fiber um, and it has to be raked and maintained quite a bit. So the Massachusetts Architectural Asset Access Board, you know, um, I th everyone thought it was going to happen last summer, but it may happen this summer. They would actually, um, you know, prohibit wood chips because they're often not accessible. I agree the rubber eye surface is pretty expensive as a per square foot cost. Um, and so, you know, that's just, that's something that, um, you know, there aren't many other surfaces right now uh, under play equipment that would be accessible and also have the, you know, the padding um, to meet the fall safe requirements as well. So when I went to Crocker Farm because um, they have an accessible playground, that, a preschool program that was built a few years ago. Yeah. And it did, it had wood chips and it had some rubberized um, kind of pathways. And at least 40% of it, like from the building out to the equipment was concrete. And I know that kids in wheelchairs um, and with different disabilities use that playground. So I thought that was a good model, um, maybe yeah. for some accessibility issues. But it, you know, I was, I, and then I walked out in some wood chips. You know, I, I feel like one of the, this is like an area of expertise I've had after, you know, playgrounds and having um, kids that are constantly running around. The wood chips weren't that hard, to, like they weren't, they seemed like you could get a wheelchair over them. And so I would just consider that because it seems like you take a really big, ticket item and the wood chips are very forgiving for kids that fall. Um, mm -hmm. I wondered about the sandbox. Is it going to be covered at night? Are we going to have cats in there? That kind of issue? Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure. That's, that's, that's a good question. Okay. Um, I'll um, take note. The, the other thing I thought is, um, you know, at, at, at Wildwood School now, which may be closed in the future, there's a really amazing wood kind of castle playground there. And there used to be a similar one at Fort River, but it was taken down because it became, I guess, after 40 years too, um, it wasn't well maintained, it became sort of dangerous. And I wondered if you had looked at that, because I remember that as one of the most creative playground equipments and also that it fits that natural wood look. Is that something that you considered? It also seemed like it got a lot of votes from the public too. Yeah, no, I think, um, yeah. And there used to be one at Jackson Street School in Northampton. Um, yeah, we, I, I, yeah, I've been to the, all those with my kids. I think the, um, you know, when, when we talk to vendors, they, they say now that that type of structure won't meet certain codes or standards. And so, you know, we we actually did look, there are, are a few that, um, do something similar. And so, um, there are a few different vendors out there that have, uh, more of a natural wood structure. And so we, we are, we are looking at those. Um, Isn't the pressurized wood a bit of a problem? That's why I think a lot of these that we like wouldn't actually be built now. It is. It also that, made them more affordable. It hmm. was, and it was, and it was use a, real wood. Yeah, I think that's a. It's a good point, though. There are some now that are using a combination of real, you know, wood and maybe synthetic wood, uh, and they're doing it in a way that it can meet the current standards. Um, so that's yeah. Yeah, because I thought those those two, like my kids have played on those a long time, and kids seem to love them. And it's sort of very creative spaces, and they're kind of mm -hmm. running around. And the one that is being built um, um, at Groff Park, there, there was there was an accessible ramp to, to get onto parts of that, and I thought that was kind of cool, too. Um, mm -hmm. Other questions I had were um, about bathrooms, because that seemed like the Kendrick Park um, committee, that they saw the needs for bathrooms. And so... You know, if you go to a lot of the playgrounds, there are bathrooms where you can get into Wildwood School or, you know, you can get, there's a bathroom at the middle school that nobody knows about until you do know. And so it just seems like if you are bringing young kids to a park and have people of all ages, the need for a bathroom is really important. And if you're going to want people to visit it, they have to. And, you know, my kids have also sold Christmas trees for years and they used to run across the street to like a um, sub shop across to use that bathroom 
Um, and so I just, you know, and, and the people of the sub shop were nice to let them do that. But are, are the local businesses willing to open up their bathrooms to kids? Um, you know, what's, what's the solution to that problem? Yeah, I'm just trying to that's been, um, yeah, you know, we've talked with the, the bid a little bit in chamber about this, um, ta the town has, and, you know, there's still ongoing discussions, I'd say, you know, there hasn't been, um, you know, I don't, I don't think, you know, a resolution on that, um, you know, public restrooms are outside the scope of this project. Uh, it has been mentioned that it is something that may be a necessity. So, um, yeah, I, that's something that is still part of the conversation um, for, for this area of down, even of downtown in general. Um, and the last thing I'll say, at least at this point, is I, I, I love the idea of having lots of equipment and having the wood area and for kids to have sort of free play. Um, I, you know, the, the slide is built into the side of the hill is, you know, an amazing feature. Don't make it too big because the kids can really rock it. And I, I can give a long story that involves at the end of me, me having a broken nose. So it doesn't look like we're going to run into that situation. I did when I looked at the plan, I'm, I really kind of questioned the amphitheater space. I thought that, I just thought kids are probably not going to use that that much. And maybe that could be dedicated to more of um, a play space or some kind of another structure, especially if the amphitheater to the south is built. Like I think kids would throng to a big amphitheater and be standing with their hands out, you know, in front of a crowd or have more play in a larger space than that kind of little space. And I, my fear was that we put money into an amphitheater and it wouldn't be that well used. Is, is there some kind of programming of little theater groups or is it just you're hoping the kids will use that? Because to me, that was probably the least attractive if I was like a five or six year old. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, there's um, the idea that there'd be some granite curbing, uh, you know, as the seating that is nestled in the hillside and then just a flat area. So, you know, we're calling it a stage or amphitheater area. Uh, and what We haven't envisioned necessarily programming it. I mean, I guess kids can play with it however they'd like. Um, you know, to your point, you know, could there be a way to keep, you know, we could there be a way to rearrange the space or something um, to allow more free play? Mm -hmm. you, know, yes. you know, my thought is we're calling it an amphitheater. We could have called it something else. Um, and maybe we can look at how to, you know, um, you know, tweak that area or adjust it a little bit. So maybe it's not uh, so formal as, you know, seating for a stage or for a you know, flat area, but maybe it's just a, another play space. Oh, um, you know what? I just remember my last thing, my last last, my real last thing is what happened to swings? Because swings are like the most fun thing. Like little kids can be on swings, kids in wheelchairs mm -hmm. can be on swings, adults can be on swings. Is there any plan for swings here? I'm not, I don't think so. Swings are really interesting. There's, um, I, I agree, swing, people like swings. They also take up a lot of area. Uh, so the required fall safe zone around a swing set is quite large. And so the, um, you know, the way they, the regulations work now is you need quite a bit of space around a swing set to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, and because the swings are moving, you, sometimes you can overlap fall safe zones depending on the type of equipment mm -hmm. but with swings it's pretty much a dedicated area so it's, it's um you know again it's something we could look at at groff we you know we decided to use some toddler swings and we have um you know um a larger swing that uh can be somewhat accessible or someone could transfer to it um mm -hmm. so that there's not the typical they don't do like the old style swings necessarily anymore that have like the 12 foot chains and you know you can Yes. get really high and do flips off of that's just not um they don't make those anymore uh -huh. uh, but let me yeah that's a, a you know that's a note we can bring back to the group so that's something i i, I have written down and then kids in wheelchairs and that's an ex i mean that's a you know there's not a whole bunch in the park that a kid could do and that's i've seen mm -hmm. kids in wheelchairs or with disabilities using those swings and it, they're just fun so i, I would uh, I'd yeah have a swing i think for me no the, no yeah there are some accessible swings we also in this play area there's um um, what we've we've asked the vendors about there's an accessible spinner so it's actually at grade and it's mm -hmm. pretty big and it has um, a seat on it and someone that's in a wheelchair can get on it and it actually spins okay. and a number of people can be on it and so mm -hmm. we've uh, we've inquired about that um, just because we like it. it is at grade and it could be you know it seems like it's 
based on the research we've done online, it seems like it's something that doesn't require a huge fall safe area. Uh, and it also looks like, in, you know, it's like a lot of fun. Um, it seems like every child uh, should have the opportunity to get nauseated in one of those too, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Thank you, Nate. Um, Chris, yeah. I've seen you raise your hand a few times. Do you want to add some comments to some of these questions? I think Nate's covered it all. Every time I raised my hand, he came up with the answer I would have come up with. So I don't Thank need you. to talk. <laughs> Great. I've seen Jack's hand is up. Yes, I see that. Thank you. Um, at this time, I will call on Jack. Hello. Um, I agree with pretty much what uh, Edwin has said. <clears throat> um, the schematic, I was a little confused. You know, it is outdated, as Mike uh, had mentioned. Um, and then I was kind of a little bit conflicted with the number of crosswalks that that uh, Christine brought up and then I'm thinking would you know the number of crosswalks be a calming factor if there's no fence but then I'm just thinking how hard it is just to turn on to East Pleasant you know if you're on Prey Street with all the traffic and what was the purpose of the rotary but yet to you know get traffic through there sort of thing so all these things were uh, competing in my mind in terms of uh, you know making this area um you know acceptable to vehicle traffic but also safe for uh you know the kids and and uh other park participants so those are you know things to to think about and mm -hmm. uh, the parking is that all going to be normal um parking uh not free parking, but it'd be meter parking. Actually, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Jack. I just want to point out to people that right now, currently at the bottom of the of that picture, there's some 50 cent per hour uh, meter parking, but most of it, about two thirds of that North Pleasant Street is currently um, town center permit. So just add to your comment, if Nate, I don't know if you all have discussed or thought about parking. I do like seeing the angled parking. It fits more cars in. And if you could address how it looked like uh, that was proposed as a turning it to a one way, which reduces traffic and could open up more parking. Yeah, I think the um, we haven't um, fully addressed the parking around the park, but in, in um, you know, I, in the um, in the CISO group plan, you can see here they have angled parking on North Pleasant, and the idea had been discussed about making it one way. And so, in the current um, in the current concept that um, we've been working on, staff's been working on, you know, the playground is located far enough in from North Pleasant Street that if angled parking was to be included, we wouldn't disrupt the playground area. So we're, you know, we've designed the playground with that consideration in mind that if we needed to put parking along North Pleasant Street angled in, we'd have the space to do that because, you know, it would, it would come into the, inside the green space a little bit, inside the curb. Um, so although it's shown on the current concept, that's just, you know, that's something that isn't, hasn't really been discussed. It's, you know, just to make sure we have the space for it if needed. Any other um, questions, Jack? Oh, uh, I was just going to say uh, the Crocker Farm is an interesting example because uh, I live my, my property at Bud's Crocker Farm, um, and the the playgrounds that Janet mentioned are to the north of the school, and that's one uh, situation. But the the playground that's off the basketball courts there have all the wood chips and that, and it's just it's kind of a disaster area in terms of the washout and things like that. So I can understand how wood chips just. You know they don't you know for, for certain settings they might be okay but it's uh it can be a disaster uh, unless there's a lot of maintenance uh involved thanks jack that's all i have thanks thanks um i have a question for nate um what are the hours of operation right now for the parks that we have in town they're typically open you know dawn till dusk so there's not um you know, I'm not sure some may be more specific in terms of hours, but, you know, public works opens them pretty early and closes them 
in the evening. So, I mean, it could be more like, you know, seven to in the summer, say seven to seven. Um, but, you know, typically just during the daylight hours. So I can see at a lot of these parks how that would be very reasonable and natural. People would just stop going, especially if there's not lights. Right. Um, downtown, um, as others have brought up, you know, we, we're we trying to attract some people downtown right. to use the businesses, go out for ice cream in the evening, whatever. Um, so that might have to be a little different. And I noticed you said that you're not planning for lights in the park. They'd be on the outer edge of the park. Um, and I know you don't necessarily want to put lights in the play area because that would entice people, but is there any discussion or thought about having motion um, set, you know, um, motion lights so that, you know, this would help the police and stuff to be able to see if people are in there. Because if it's dark, then people can be sitting in the, you know, in those areas and sort of hanging out. But if you put mm -hmm. motion then that would signal to the police or whoever that there might be activity there they need to check. Right. Yeah. I think we're, um, the idea is to bring, you know, have um, lights along that East West walkway and um, public works had suggested maybe running electrical up into the play area and maybe along one of the walkways to the North just to have it. Um, so then in the future, if we needed to bring in bollard lighting or, you know, the motion sensor lights, interesting, you know, the utilities would be there. So it's been a part of the conversation. Um, and, you know, there is, there are other electrical points at Kendrick. There's some new boxes on the, along East Pleasant. So we could always run uh, some utilities later, but we are planning to run at least electrical. Um, and then now would probably be the time at least to run, run some more conduit uh, just to have that ability. That, yeah, that would give options. Right. Yeah. Uh, Chris, do you have something to add? Yes, I wanted to say that there is a plan for lighting the entire park, uh, but we just didn't have enough money right now to light the playground, and I'm not sure there was a plan to light the playground. But as far as the park as a whole, there is a plan to light the park. Um, so we can have a discussion about lighting the playground, but I just wanted to let people know that, you know, the overall scheme will have lighting. Well, I understand a cost has so much to do with this, but if there is the ability to at least run conduit into the playground area, um, then they can give thought to adding, like I said, like it's security, the motion lights kind of thing. Um, thank you. Uh, at this time, I'm gonna call on David. Janet, I see your hand, but I'm gonna, I'm trying to get everyone to have a, a first shot. Um, so David, I call on you. Thank you. Um, Nate, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I think you, you hit a lot. I look forward to the site plan review. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, since a lot, it seems to be one of the goals of the this is to try to attract more people and people from outside of Amherst to to <clears throat> the north end of downtown. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, can you? I, I'm I'm hoping that that in the next picture that you show us the next plan you can also show me where there may be some signs that point people to go to visit more of the town once they're there to get that ice cream and that um, milkshake that's it yeah that's, thank you yep okay now yeah yep great thank you uh, janet okay. um let's see And Pam, could you put it back on the park? The schematic uh, design. The planet is muted. There, thank you. Pam, can you unmute Janet? I'm trying. I'm trying to to see what what happened. Wait, Janet, mm -hmm. if you go to the lower left. You should be able to, it should pop up and you can touch okay. it. Okay, am I here? <laughs> yes, are. we hear you. So in terms of, uh, Christine, I wanted to thank you for sending the Kendrick Park um, um, kind of summary to me. And I really, I, I built and building on the work of the committee, which was don't cut into the park to create parking. I was down there today and it seemed to me that you could add more um, public spaces, just parallel parking along the street. There was plenty of room for that especially if it went to a one way, or you could maybe when you're looking at this, 
Nate to like look at um, there's like business spaces across the street. Maybe they can be used also for become public parking spaces. There seems to be a lot of parking on that street without having to cut into Kentrick Park to do the pull-in spaces. Um, and then the hope would be that people could take the bus downtown and use the park too, that everyone's not always going to drive there and things like that. Or maybe they're parking at a different business for a while and they walk over with their kids to play too. So but if you're looking at parking needs, my preference would be just to keep the park as a park and kind of work with that street because it's you know it seemed ample to have more um, parallel parking along the north side further down instead of just a few spaces they have there without and it seemed like cars could easily pass by so mm -hmm. I, I just want to encourage that if if the road is turned to a one way that frees up some of the width so that it, you could do that angled parking without cutting as much into the park. Just to, so if they, as they're looking at this in the big picture. Um, I'm gonna call on Maria. Um, uh, for, right, since we're talking about access, um, maybe just a couple more bike rackets. I see you have two. And then I think there's one of those ride share stands yes. on the east side of the park. So. That's great. I think, yeah, encouraging multi modes of transportation of people getting to the park would be great. But I think, yeah, just a few more bike racks, maybe on wherever you make the connection points, you know, maybe there's some on the west side as well. But yeah, I think, I think it's great location. I mean, it's, it's hopefully, you know, encouraging people to walk downtown, ride their bikes and take public transportation. But yeah, just a couple more bike racks, probably. I think we say that on every project. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I see uh, Doug. Yeah, I was gonna um, just say that I'm. I don't see any sort of uh, edge, continuous edge sidewalk on every facet of the park, um, and. Uh, so when you come back and you have the revised plan of the entire park, it would be helpful to, to have some conversation about the circulation that is expected on the perimeter. And then we'd have a better picture of the other walkways that are proposed inside, at least as part of this project. Okay. So at this time, I don't see any other hands raised. Uh, do the board members, anyone else have a question before I, um, I haven't uh, opened it up to public. I see one hand on our attendees. Board members, any other questions? I see none. Um, so this is our first go at this. Uh, so Pam, are you ready? <laughs> um, allowed to talk, yes. Are we ready? Yeah, so I'll call on Barbara Pearson. Uh, we assume it's Barbara Pearson. If you could um, give your name and your address. Yes, my name is Barbara Pearson. I live at 11 Page Street, not too far from Kendrick Park. Welcome, thank you. And I had two, two kinds of comments. One is, um, selfishly, without kids here, I cross the park to get to the bus at Prey Street. And um, it seems to me that where the crosswalks are now are not very ideal for getting to Prey Street, but they're not terrible. But one of the problems is all winter you can't, or whenever there's snow, it's hard to get across the park. So if there is some kind of a walkway, do we think it will get cleared in the winter? Nate? Sorry, I was muted. The um, the gray the the walkway that's east to west or the gray walkway. The idea would be that that would um, become um, you know just like a sidewalk and would be paved during the winter. So the idea would be to have at least a five foot walkway that's maintained year round. Okay. And then the other the other comment that I had about the parking, the angle parking as opposed to parallel parking, mm -hmm. um, was just that it seemed to me that when you're taking kids in and out of a car it would be nice to have access on both sides that wouldn't be into the traffic so that in a way the angle parking would be better that way.
Thank you for your um, your questions and comments. Is there anything else? No, thank you. Well, I mean, there's tons, but that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you got to your important ones. Thank you. Okay, at this time, I don't see any other hands in the attendees. Pam, did we get any on phone or are we good? As far as I know, we did not get any on the phone. Okay, so I'm going back to panelists. I still see no hands. Um, uh, Nate, do you wanna, or Chris, wanna give a summary at this point? Um, when we'll see this again? Yeah, I think, you know, Chris had said that, you know, even for the public listening, the design review board is meeting um, um, April 22nd to look at this project and hopefully we'll have, you know, further, um, further the plans and some of the, um, some of the amenity choices. And then uh, we're also applying for site plan review with the hope that the planning board would take this up um, on May 6th. So that would, you know, return to the planning board um, uh, and if, you know, I guess three weeks or so. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for this very helpful and informative presentation. Um, the slides were great. And uh, Chris, I, I think we might see it on May 6th. Yes, that's right. Yep. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Nate. All right, thanks, everyone. So I'm going to leave the meeting and I've, I've taken all the comments and notes down. So that's really helpful. Uh, and I can share them with staff. So thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, so Pam is going to be um, changing out the, uh, the view and we're going to move to item four, public hearings, scenic roads, uh, joint hearing with the tree warden. I wanna say that I, I saw him earlier on the screen. Uh, yes, we have Alan Snow, the town tree warden with us. You're a little bit more in the dark now than you were earlier. Sun setting. <laughs> okay. So, so I'll move to the preamble. In accordance with the provisions of MGL chapter 40, uh, section 5C, scenic roads, and chapter 87, section 3, shade trees, this joint public hearing between the planning board and the tree warden has been duly advertised in the Daily Hampshire Gazette and posted in town hall. Uh, 705, it's now 734. Uh, scenic Road tree removal for a driveway cut at Leverett Road at the southeast corner, Leverett Road, map 3A, parcel 21. Public shade trees impacted by this project include the following trees. And it says um, six, less than six inch uh, diameter uh, maples. Um, are there any board disclosures? You could hit your, um, raise your hand if you have a board disclosure. I see none. Um, so at this time we'll uh, move to, I think Mr. Snow or Chris Bestrup, which one is going to speak first? I think Alan should give the presentation. Okay. All right. Um, I'm assuming that you can see me. Um, sort of. You're you're like hiding in the dark. <laughs> Sorry about that. But, but um, we can hear you, so that's <laughs> the most important. Part. Dark is good. Um, <laughs> so I did. I met with the uh, applicant out on um, Lever Road. Um, he discussed the uh, development of that parcel, and uh, we discussed potential locations for a curb cut that would minimize the damage to trees in the area. Um, and this is the area that was selected. Um, they are, uh, it's really only five trees, um, two that are roughly four inches in diameter sugar maples, two that are about three, excuse me, two that are about two inches in diameter and one three inch diameter tree. They're all sugar maples. Um, one of the um, two inch trees actually is com just about completely dead, the top of the tree is um, is all dead. Um, so I really would need to include that in the tree hearing ultimately. 
Um, but uh, so we, we did design the or determine the location based on tree preservation and meeting the goals of his project uh, with, the, with the development. Is so is it what I when I read the preamble it says six trees, and now you're saying it five. Oh great, Pam put up the picture. So it's five, but are you saying one of those is pretty much dead? So it's more like yeah. four. Yeah. So uh, it's really only four trees because I um, I don't think we just didn't notice um, when we were looking at them before that the top the lower branches of the tree were alive. The bottom say the bottom eight feet of the tree is alive, the top eight feet is, um, is dead. Uh, so I, I probably shouldn't have included that in this at all. Um, but uh, so we have four trees that are healthy sugar maple trees um, that are very young um, that uh, would be removed. And your recommendation? My recommendation is to allow the removal of the trees um, okay. so that he can uh, you know, do his project. Okay, thank you. Um, at this time, we could uh, have a report of a site visit that I actually don't have the date of when that happened. Chris Bestrup probably does. And I do believe Michael volunteered to give the um, site visit report. Yes, uh, well, Chris has the date, I guess. The date was St. Patrick's Day. Oh. March 17th. How could I forget that? Uh, well, there were many of the planning board members who were present. Uh, I'm not sure exactly which ones, but it was it was almost a quorum, or maybe it was a quorum. In any event, we uh, saw the site basically as Mr. Snow described it. Uh, the uh, maple trees, uh, the small maple trees in question, are very small, even smaller than that they show in the pictures. Um, and uh, the surrounding trees, there are a number of mature maple trees. I presume they're maples, I'm not sure. But there are a number of mature trees uh, in the general vicinity along the roadside. And uh, uh, it would appear that the smaller, the four or five smaller trees which we're uh, discussing uh, would not significantly impact uh, the, the uh, townscape, the streetscape. Uh, and uh, beyond that, that's about all we, we noticed. Thank you, Michael. Um, at this time, um, I will open it up to the board for anyone who has questions, um, especially to Mr. Snow. And I see no hands raised. Um, at this point, I will open it up. Let me click here to see. Um, are there any uh, public out there that would like to ask questions? And I see no hands raised there. So, um, ha did we receive any, I think, did we get any um, letters or emails through today before this meeting, Chris or Pam, on this issue? Chris. We did not. I asked Pam to check right before the meeting started and we hadn't received any emails about this and we didn't receive any letters either. Okay. Um, I just have one question. Um, I assume there's a replacement fee for removal for these trees still? Um, under, our, under the new um, tree ordinance that we uh, came up with last uh, two years ago, um, I excluded trees under five inches in diameter um, because it was becoming obvious that uh, on heavily brushy roads um, under Mass General Law Chapter 87, it's, um, you know, every tree that's, you know, I think it was an inch and a half in caliper um, would be included. Um, so we, we, we set the limit at five inches. Um, so none of these trees actually do qualify for the replacement value. Seems reasonable. Um, again, I'm going to ask uh, if there's any questions. I see Michael has his hand up. Oh, unmute, Michael. I would like to move that we approve the removal of the trees. 
And so you're making a motion yes. to vote to um, sure. uh, our recommendation would be to support the tree warden. Yes. And his recommendation to cut these trees. And to close the public hearing. And, yes. and to close. So I see, and I, all right. Um, I think David, um, I'm calling on David. Are you seconding? I'll Doing second the motion. You are, thank you. All right, so we do have a motion on the table. I uh, had seen Janet's hand up. I'm gonna open it to her because she might've had a question. So we're opening to questions. Janet. Um, thank you. I had a question for Mr. Snow is, even if you're not requiring people to put money in the tree replacement fund, have you, has the town in the past asked people to, you know, if you're taking four trees down to put four trees, you know, young trees somewhere else on the property? Has that happened or is that an idea that you would recommend? Yes. Yeah, so um, during my site visit with the applicant, we discuss, you know, um, his, his landscaping plans for the area. Mm -hmm. And then we did discuss planting trees further back from the road. Um, if he, uh, you know, was interested in planting trees um, when he's finished with his project and he, you know, he and his, uh, um, partner uh, seemed to really enjoy trees and they are very excited about uh, landscape in the yard and, and maintaining a rural uh, treed road. So. so that would be sort of their option, but not like we the town's never required them to replace it somewhere else. Is that just, I'm just wondering. Correct. I, you know, under Master in Law Chapter 7, a tree warden doesn't have, you know, really empowers um, Mm -hmm. to tell people what to do with their private property, essentially. Okay. Just wondered. Thanks. Okay, I see no other hands at this time from the board members. Um, so we have a motion on the table so we can take a vote. Um, still see no hands. So we'll go with a vote. We have to do it like a roll call, sort of like how I took attendance or in the very beginning did a roll call. So. Um, I will go through the list of members again. So unmute yourself and um, A or an A and, um, or abstain and then remute yourself and we'll go through the list. So I will go to Michael first. Aye. Maria? Yes, aye. Jack? Aye. Um, David? Yes. Doug? Yes. Janet? Yes. And myself also yes. So I believe that's unanimous. Um, so we will be sending um, an agreement to Mr. Snow's uh, statement that this will go to the town council. Chris, is there anything else we need to do? No, there isn't. Thank you. Okay. So at this time, we're um, gonna go to item five, topics not anticipated 48 hours prior to the meeting. Chris, is there anything? Um, nothing at this time. Okay. So at this time, I'm going to move back to item two, which was the public comment period. Um, if there's any hands, raise them now. Um, and I don't see any hands, so I don't think there's any general public comment for tonight. And I do believe we're at item six, adjournment. Good job, everybody. This was very successful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. All right. Until the next time, everyone, everyone stay well. It was good to see you. <laughs>